Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Doris. I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> Warren Lee, it's a privilege to see you again. It's a privilege to see all these fine folk again. I consider it a singular privilege to be asked to address the ladies' meeting. This way I get to talk to the best-looking part of NFO. <laughs> We've been sort of reminiscing a little bit. I don't want to go any further back than just this past year. I could probably tell some anecdotes, and I'm suspicious that perhaps Staley is going to tell some. <laughs> but I will not uh, tell any stories on what happened years ago, other than to tell you that you're lucky to have me here tonight, because I was asked to MC the Ayatollah Khomeini Jazz Festival. <laughs> <clears throat> And that's been canceled. <laughs> but I do have a business venture forthcoming, and I'd like to ask the people from Michigan, maybe they'd like to work for me. I've been asked to be the distributor for all of lower Michigan for the new Iranian soft drink called the Ayatollah Cola. <laughs> it doesn't uh, do much for the Iranians, but it gives Americans gas. Gas in any form is welcome today. <clears throat> I've done some research because Khomeini has become the password today. He's always in the news. And it was interesting to me to find out that he attended a university in Egypt. How many people here knew that? <laughs> he attended a university in Egypt that was named after the very last king of Egypt, King Farouk. The university is known as Farouk U. <laughs> We're here under the heading of NFO, the National Farmers Organization, an organization that's in business today, bargaining for and handling agricultural commodities. And just to lead into an agricultural commodity, I'd like to tell you about a man named Artie. Doris told me not to tell this, but I don't see her here. <laughs> Artie, in my opinion, is important to this because it leads us into agricultural commodities. Artie was a hitman for the Chicago mob. It was Artie's assignment to go out and do away with or blow away people that got in the way, and he was given an assignment one day to do away with three guys, people that were giving the mob a whole lot of headaches, and Artie went about his business. He located the three men in a local supermarket, and lo and behold, when he went to do his job, he found he had left his gun home. Well, Artie wasn't a man to stop at little matters like that, so he proceeded with a job. He strangled the three guys. And he got the job done. He went and reported to the mob. He says, I did away with those three guys. Pay me. They said, you did a lousy job. We're not going to pay you. You didn't do it according to our tradition. You didn't do it right. You did a poor job. We're not going to pay you. Artie harangued and and argued, and finally this is all right, we'll give you one dollar, just a token sum, so we get you off our necks. Next day, newspapers carried the following headline, Artie chokes three, four dollar at local supermarket. I'm not sure that I envy my position. I don't know how many times I've played number two man or warm-up man for Orrin Lee Staley <laughs> and for Earhart Pinkston and for your present national president, but it's been a privilege and honor. Now, perhaps 
a little bit of seriousness. I'd like to mention just four, four things, four items, and those very briefly. American agriculture, the National Farmers Organization, collective bargaining. Now, we're starting to hear new termino terminology this year. We have an energy crisis, severe. We're talking about rationing. I think Mr. Otley did this voluntarily some years ago. I have to think about that for a while. <laughs> Energy crisis. Now, we're talking about energy agriculture. Headlines in my hometown newspaper, the Kalamazoo Gazette, read as follows. Farmers eye harvest of moonshine. They're going to make alcohol out of corn. This is nothing new, but the amazing thing to me is that one year ago, we started to talk about making alcohol out of corn, using it for fuel, and what did the wise men at our universities tell us? This is a feudal effort because it takes as much energy to produce the alcohol out of corn as the energy it produces. In other words, it comes out even. Today, we read in the paper that through improved methods in one short year, we can produce 85,000 BTU per gallon of 200 proof alcohol, and it only takes 35,000 BTU to produce it. So we're well underway to solving the energy problem through energy agriculture. The point I want to make is that this comes from your land. You own it. Point number two. And this is from an article that appeared in the Chicago paper very recently. Headline, America's Harvest, the Ultimate Political Weapon. And all you have to do is drive out in rural America and see those lines of grain elevators and in the past few months, those seemingly endless lines of trucks coming up to those elevators or emptying their golden harvest into farm storage when you realize that here truly is a weapon, the ultimate political weapon, which leads us into the energy crisis again. And let me read verbatim from this article. Talked about the shortage, the difficulties that confront us. The man writes, and I can give you the name of the author of this article if you want it. Americans can do without. They can adapt to change. The U.S. is not irrevocably wedded to oil as a prime energy source. The soil on which we stand is a real muscle that can give us strength to win any race to see whose belly grumbles before gas tanks run dry. And the amazing part of it is that you own it. You own it. Point three, America's agricultural exports, a boon to the American economy. American agricultural exports in 1978-79 totaled $32 billion. Projection for the coming 79-80 export season is $38 billion. But for 1984, the projection is $70 billion. 
dollars, much needed dollars to help our balance of payments. The only area outside of the manufacturing of airplanes and the manufacturing of computers where we still excel. We are number one. And you own it. Number four. Number two, mine has to only allotted a certain number, amount of time, so I got to speed right through this. Hope you appreciate this, Orrin Leaf. <laughs> number four, the National Farmers Organization. I didn't realize that we had come here to pay tribute to Orrin Lee Staley. I'm happy to participate in it, and I could have, I'm sure, come up with a number of accolades, but we've already heard several, and we certainly appreciate the enormous amount of work that's been done by this one man. But as I said earlier, I'm talking about one year, this past year. The organization has gone through some tremendous battles led by tremendous people. It's fought for its very existence. And this past year has shown signs of stabilizing and becoming more and more mature, becoming a reckoned factor in the marketplace. And certainly, as was already mentioned and had been done prior to this year, we have professional people that can handle anything that you people produce. Now, I noticed a curious thing in a church publication that my wife and I have received for a number of years. <clears throat> it has to do with organizations, primarily churches. But the odd thing to me was that it also fit the NFO. Let me read to you what it says talks about new organizations, how they develop, how they proceed with enthusiasm, with evangelism, and seemingly just bound over any obstacles. And then, eventually, the crusading compulsion was lost in the conservation of the institution until the resources of men and finances were largely expended in keeping the institution afloat. Now understand, this is a basic statement covering many, many types of organizations. This organization is composed of and put together of people. And the same type of things have happened to us. We have witnessed evangelism. We have witnessed enthusiasm. We have witnessed bravery. We have witnessed everything you care to mention in the way of organizing. Now we're in the marketplace and we have become a stable factor to be reckoned with. Now, I have a question. Are we aware of the fact that this is a major tool, the missing link in a successful agricultural picture? Or do we look at it as an ad I saw not too long ago? It appeared in a Wall Street Journal and I think was plagiarized from some newspaper in Wisconsin. The ad read as follows, wanted a young lady between the ages of 25 to 30 with tractor to work on dairy farm to clean barns, milk cows, and make hay. P.S. Send picture of tractor. <laughs> Are we farmers still so befuddled that we ask for a picture of a tractor when we have this type of thing to look at? 
whoever tried to sleep with a tractor. <laughs> you have the best organization in agriculture right here. You have assembled to transact business, which you do once a year, to elect officials. Do you recognize the tool that you have before you? Do you know what the odds are of successful bargaining without an organization? Currently, there are roughly one million commercial farms in this country in round figures. I like round figures. That's why I'm at the ladies' meeting. One million farmers who deal with five major buyers of any commodity you want to mention. What are the odds that you are big enough to deal with even one of these people as an equal? Think about it. One million to five. Those are your odds without an organization. You have the organization. You own it. I've talked to many people at many a sausage feed, and during the past two years, I've always closed with the following statement, and I think it's still valid. It's a quote from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, which says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What comes to your mind when somebody says meek? Some of the ladies are looking at their husbands. <laughs> what comes to your mind when someone says meek? I didn't know what it really meant until I heard an explanation once. Meek means that you're willing to subject yourself to the training and discipline necessary to work together with your fellow man. In the area of Christianity, to work according to the teachings of Christ. In the area of NFO, it's to learn how your organization operates, go out and evangelize, get some more members, and use this organization. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're one jump ahead. You own it. Thank you. When you get a group like this together, you can't help but have a good time. Oris's comment about paying tribute to Orrin Lee is just part of it. We're paying tribute to NFO and this marvelous array of crusading energy you've seen up here tonight. Uh, heaven knows I could have stopped a hundred different people in the halls and come up with just about the same kind of chemistry. We've been such a fortunate organization I think Phil Allen described it best one time when he said, in this place, he said, you can look in any direction, and they're all originals, bigger than life size. And I think that the future will have to go some if it's going to be as colorful. But the stage has been set, and the new players that are coming into it have the most promising time of our lives as well as theirs, all of us. And I am pleased to be able to present to you a leader who gave this organization direction for the many years and then passed what seems to me probably the most, the ultimate test of leadership, and that was being able to pass the reins of leadership from one champion to another. And we have reaped the benefits, folks. There's very little that I can say about Mr. Staley that hasn't been said at one time or another, and all of you here know him well. And it's my pleasure and privilege to 
introduce him to those who perhaps are new members and share, have him share with us tonight some thoughts about what NFO can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, there's no way to pass on a memorial type of salute to the type of organization we've had to me. Because, you know, I never did anything in the NFO. It was all of usins. And that's the type of a team we had, and to that goes the credit for whatever has been achieved. And I do have the last word tonight, uh, just a moment, I guess. You know, two things. For the first time that I've ever had a man said that I'm going to go and prepare the way for you was his words in a sermon-like tone, you know. And he left me the bill to pay for his. And so, Ars Canerva, you owe me four dollars and ninety-seven cents. <laughs> ninety-seven, no argument. I have the floor right now. <laughs> you had your turn. That's why I want cigarettes. Oh. <laughs> And you know, he entered the jet age a little early. Just as the jets were coming into fashion, he and Alvin Russ were in Des Moines, Iowa, sitting behind a jet as it was gearing up. And for some reason, in that little Mooney plane, it got to bouncing. And when it got through bouncing, it had <laughs> gone right back over <laughs> with, with Oris Canerva on the outside and Alvin Russ hanging by the belt saying, get me out of here as the gas was pouring out of the tanks. Am I right, Oris Canerva? <laughs> and it was worth $13,000 and it did $11,000 worth of damage and never moved 20 feet. <laughs> And Don Zamalek, going down the line here, you know how we got to call him Molik? There was a great guy over in Wisconsin who we thought ought to be organizing a little more, and he just wasn't quite doing it. And he always was sawing wood every time Don would call out in the office to say how many members you're getting today. And he always called in, he'd say, is Molik there? So we called him Molik because one day Molik said, surely undoubtedly you can get somebody else to saw wood. That's surely not an impossible job. But he would not yield. He sawed wood until <laughs> he got enough wood to last him all winter. He didn't get many members, but he got a lot of wood sawed. And Molik, as a result, we called him Molik around the office. And Lee, well... I remember Lee and a guy in Minnesota when we were organizing up there about the fastest we were organizing anywhere. What was it he always said as he pounded his chest to that snooks or snook or what was it he called that? You know, up in Minnesota, the guy that you were a good friend of and you guys got so many members. Oh, Leroy Wright. No, 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 no. Uh -uh, I know Leroy. I can't remember the other guy. I saw Leroy tonight. Man, my memory's better than yours. You think a little bit and we'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> you remember him up there in Minnesota? He always pounded his chest. He had snoop. No, you're close. Huh? No? No? Yep, there it is. <laughs> we got a man that knows it. Mr. Utley didn't quite tell all that just as it happened. He was in self-defense. It did happen almost the way, way he said it. But if you could have heard how Blondie, his wife, said, when I said, could I talk to Glenn, she said, I don't know whether he's here or not. And then if you could have heard her when she knew what she'd said... 
And that has been a standing joke now that's been pub for years that is now public. <laughs> and Kenton, that great voice, and I remember some of those short turns we made around a few of those roads up there, the first time I was up there, and some of the things. And Doris, well, I remember her and her partner gal in Minnesota. As Fink said one night, I'm sure glad they're on our side, not against us. <laughs> As they were up there, Mary, Mary Wollen House. And Joe, one of, one of the greatest thrills. When I called to find out how they'd done in a meeting in his area, not knowing Joe Sonnemoser, we were over in another meeting. And by that time, we had about $1,200, I think, in the treasure. And Joe Sonnemoser, it was told that five Sonnemosers, and I didn't know him, had signed membership agreements that night. And those were only $25, but out of that, I believe they got 22 or 23 that night. And that added up to about $500, and that was the biggest wagon wheel you ever saw. <laughs> Folks, I didn't come uh, here other than to wish you the best. And to say simply, my heart is with you, my prayers are with you, and my wishes are with you. So that there's no misunderstanding. You know, I never started out to spend a lifetime in public life. Not very many ever believed that. But I knew it. I intended to spend a couple years, and then I got a few other people involved, and they spent a little more time than expected. And I was waiting from the beginning to some time that I thought that I had been able to achieve enough that I could pass it on with the heritage that I wanted to see it passed on with. And if you were in that meeting on October 3rd, 1978 in Des Moines, Iowa, when some 10,000 of us were there, when I told you that there were several farmers that if we could not get overwhelming support, how many of you remember that? That if we could not get overwhelming support, that several were going back to their own farms. At that point, I knew the date that I was going to work my heart out and if we couldn't get the overwhelming support, and we did gain, that if my value of as a leader, as me stepping aside, would serve as a shock to people that took leadership for granted, if mine was that good, that I intended to, on about February 1st, make that change. It was a long plan transition while I was working. It meant the contacting of the banks. It meant contacting, and that I did, and contacting suppliers at the right times to say what the plans were so that it would be not one of surprise and one that they would not be willing to accept. And one of the things that pleased me the most that they did understand, and they took my word and my judgment because of our long experience, when I can boy, could voice complete confidence in the staff and the people that would be taking over the leadership, I told them I thought it would strengthen the organization. There had been those that had said that they would get back in and help if I wasn't president. I didn't want anybody to have a crutch. I wanted an open road for everybody. Now, that didn't hurt me because I learned a long time ago all you do is do the best you can. If that's not good enough, there's nothing else you can do. But I was proud to hand the reins over to Devon Woodland without having to say to him in any way that he was bound to anything other than the decisions he and the board of directors would make. There was not a single undercover, undercover deal or any commitment 
that he had to be fearful of or that I had to be fearful of. And that's the integrity that the organization was built around with all of you. Well, now, you know, I'm not much of talking about the past. I want to talk about a few things. Now, I'm going to be in and out of the convention a little, and I do have uh, a few things I guess you ought to know. Uh, one is that my son and daughter-in-law and grandson, who's three and a half now, and a granddaughter live a half a mile from us. And he manages the farm operation, which I'm very proud of, and he won the Ag Award in his senior year at the university. And she won the Home Ec Award, and they have their own cow that they milk in their garden. And uh, I'm so proud of them that I bust all my buttons. But I'm just as proud of a son-in-law that many of you know, the Terry Utley that used to be with the organization, and a daughter and their daughter that's just 12, 14 miles away. And so I'm the hired man on the farm part of the time, and my daughter and I set up a real estate corporation to be incorporated as a family corporation. And you know, I don't know whether I went in with her or she went in with me, but we're having a lot of fun together, and quite a few have joined our firm. And so those that had worried about, as you had expressed many times, about my ability to make transition, I'll tell you what. I finally got back home about Friday night, dog tired. I slept all day Saturday, most of Sunday. And Monday, I was beginning to talk to the daughter if she liked going to the real estate business. And I had to go to school and study like heck. It was harder than I thought it was going to be. Because I never had much problems in school of learning. And so that's kind of the way it is. Now, I don't want to get on anything, you know, that would be advertising. But this is kind of our little ad that if you see it, the greatest earth on show, how many of you have seen it around over the country? Well, the folks back home have been very good to us, and if some of you like to take a look at them afterwards, fine. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now I want to get down to what is really the serious business. I think you're entitled to know now a few things that a few people here tonight can help verify how close we have been several times and how difficult some of the fights have been. In the milk holding action, we were just that close. Bob Mankey, where you at? You heard on WGN on a Saturday that looked like the NFO had won a holding action, right? Milk holding action, am I right? We thought he called me most, most jubilant guy that I've ever heard on the telephone. I thought we had two because we were compiling the statistics and we had a contract, as I recall, a dollar and a hundred weight increase and it only took 11 billion pounds of milk signed to that contract. And by late Friday night, we had but almost 8 billion of those 11 billion pounds. And I got a call when I first got into the office. In fact, they called me to come on up to the office from Harry, not Harry Graham, but from Herschel Newsom, the master of the Grange. And he said, I'm calling with full authority from the government that if you don't call off the milk holding action, and I've only got 15 minutes to answer, he said, they're going to take action against you. Herschel Newsom, master of the Grange that I knew pretty well. I said, I only need about 10 minutes. I called the people together at that point, and the answer was, and Lee Sinclair can verify because that was a wedding day for Lee Sinclair, not his, but his, or preparation at least for his son, right, Lee? If Lee's around. They called him out with the without the preparation for the suit having already been prepared. They were preparing it for the time he got over to the Justice Department because I'd called Herschel Newsom back and I told Herschel that we're not violating any laws 
And if we have to fight the U.S. government, we will. The holding action is going to continue. And you never saw things move as fast through government channels. And then an aftermath of that was, and we had some people that Bob and others would have met that afternoon, they got word to them by the noon hour, at the noon hour, that the government was going to take action. It wouldn't be wise to sign the contracts. And I tabbed it, the LBJ lawsuit. And that hung over our heads for a while. And you know what really put the pressure on? I told a man that was calling about it after he heard that it had been relayed to him that we were going out to raise a million dollars, a dollar from each farmer to fight LBJ's lawsuit. And they believed we could do it and they didn't want that publicity at that particular juncture in his political career. And so we got it settled. But we were down just that close of it starting through court action. I remember one particular time that I think was a turning point. How many of you were watching the Democratic National Convention when Governor Reynolds was late in the Democratic Convention? Any of you watching that year? And they said he was being occupied by the NFO holding action in Wisconsin. He had signed an order for the National Guard to be sent out. And they said there was no way to get him. The guard was to go out at midnight. I did get a hold of him, and I said, I'm not making any plea. I just want to state the facts. The press has been talking about violence. And I know that our people will help protect law and order. But if you call out the National Guard, everybody will be out as an individual. And when that happens, people could be in the, in the hills with their rifles, and there could be open warfare in the state of Wisconsin. And the only way that can be prevented is to let us exercise our leadership with somebody in every county in the state of Wisconsin working with the sheriffs and we'll be sure that whoever is violating the laws will be prosecuted. And he agreed, and that order was countermanded. And, of course, as you know, the people in Wisconsin responded very well. The SEC action, the most difficult. Never felt as helpless in my life. Worth Raleigh, where are you back there tonight? You remember in the, in the what I said, number one, they weren't going to even give us a hearing, right, as I recall it? And I said, they're going to give us a hearing if I have to take a group of farmers to the step of the SEC building, and that is not supposed to be done in Washington, D.C., as I understood. But anyway, we got a hearing, but when we got a hearing, it was the coldest hearing I've ever held or been a part of or been in. And what happened in that was that when I saw it was useless, I hope I can repeat it right, I think I can, I said it's not my choice to fight the government. And we may not be able to win, but it doesn't lessen my will to fight. And we fought them with that $5.2 million that was raised in Des Moines, Iowa, which I hated to do more than anything else. More than anything else I ever had to do, and we had to raise another $4 million. You know, we didn't have much money in the bank in the NFO, but we had tremendous will of support that could do anything and everything that had to be done. And to that I want to say, there was nothing that I ever appreciated more as a leader, nor dreaded more to do, but I knew exactly what their efforts were going to be. It was evident from the first that the man that came in to investigate us in that office had only been with SEC since the first day of April, and that was about the 10th of May worth, if I remember. And he and I wasn't there, but worth and those reported back that somebody that had been the SEC only six weeks in a Chicago office had enough influence to shake off the decisions that were about to be made in Washington, D.C. that would at least been fair, right, Worth? You remember that, I hope. Okay. 
right? And we knew what we were up against. And it was a part of Watergate which I can say as time goes on, you're going to be surprised how much the lawsuit information was supplied and information that was received the request of the government involving several people, including probably a presidential candidate, I'm guessing, on dairy suit. Those are some of the times that I thought you might like to know about. The other is, I want to make it clear that I told Yvonne Woodland, and I believed it, and I have lived by it, I have not discussed NFO issues with anybody. I told him if he needed information on something that I would be glad to give it, but he had to be his own man. That he would be stronger in some aspects and weaker in some, I hoped at least, than I was. But they had to be his own man and above everything, it had to have the support of the people. It doesn't make any difference. Because we were so close, and the structure and the system is there. And I'm going to not be very conspicuous. I didn't even want to do this tonight in this convention. I don't want it to be said or in any suspect then I'm still trying to run the organization, far be it. My interest is there, my heart's there, and practically all of our investment, except this little company we set up in real estate, all the rest of it's in agriculture, that we've worked for four generations. But let me tell you tonight what my thoughts are about many issues. There can be no other answer but collective bargaining, farmers using their production to price their products. And there's no answer for that except the volume of production being moved and united nationwide. And that the farmers have got to take care of. But let me tell you something else that's the issues in this country. I don't quite understand some of them. I've had time to observe them more closely. I can't understand why that I can remember in my lifetime when we could get 35 miles of the gallon of an auto on an automobile and we can only get 15 or 16 now. I can't understand it. What happened? Such great advancements, such great technology that we have. Look at all that great improvement. And then I get to thinking about some of the other things. Right now, I don't know how we've done it, but we're in the midst of inflation, recession, and depression at the same time. And that when we look back about energy, 